Uh, the next presenter, and last but not least, is Dr. Jean-Jacques Dubois. We welcome him. He's a researcher in the Mother Risk Program at SickKids Hospital and a licensed naturopathic doctor and the clinic director of the Liberty Clinic in downtown Toronto. He's the first naturopathic doctor to practice at the uh, Toronto Western Hospital in the Artist uh, Health Centre. And he's a leading expert on natural health products, pharmacology, and uh, pregnancy safety. And he's here to speak to us on uh, herbal medicines. I'd like you to welcome Dr. JJ. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, hanging out till the end. Um, I'll do my best to uh, catch up our lost time. Um, so just before we begin, uh, just disclosures. Um, I received an um, investigator-initiated grant from New Chapter, and I've done uh, consulting for two health companies, uh, Salt Natural and uh, Newtopia. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, one of my main areas of research, which is natural health products in uh, pregnancy. Um, so I'll take you through some of that today, and then at the end we'll uh, have some time for some questions. Um, and you'll see it's a, it's a very interesting area where um, definitely we need a lot more research. Uh, so before we begin, uh, the, way I, the way I do presentations is I give you the PubMed identification. I don't usually quote with the full reference because I find it clutters the, the, the slides. So if you need a study, you'll see they'll all be tagged with PubMed IDs at the bottom of the uh, reference on the slide. Um, okay, so the use of natural health products in pregnancy varies somewhere between about 7 and 55 percent. Uh, it depends on uh, what uh, geographical area has been surveyed. It depends on the ethnicity. Uh, it depends on the social cultural aspect of the group. Um, in Canada, thus far, we have one study that tells us in Quebec that approximately 9 percent of pregnant women will use natural health products in pregnancy. Uh, in the United States, a group of professionals that deal primarily with uh, pregnant and lactating women, these are nurse midwives, uh, see they, they basically give somewhere between 45 and 95 percent, they will administer some form of natural health product or herbal product during pregnancy. So typically the things they're giving are castor oil, uh, evening primrose oil, vitex, black cohosh, blue cohosh, uh, most of which we'll be talking about today. So the question is, well, why are people taking natural health products uh, in pregnancy? So the reason of that is because pregnant women, once they find out they're pregnant, um, there's concern about safety to the fetus. So in one study we have here uh, of about 295 pregnant women, what they found is that once women found out they're pregnant, there was some hesitancy and some issues and also some noncompliance with respect to taking uh, pharmaceutical medication during their pregnancy. So then what they turn to is natural health products. Um, so in uh, 2006, we, we did 75 systematic reviews, and we put it into this book. Uh, it's not shameless self-promotion. It's just to, uh, to illustrate the work we did. Um, and um, in, the, um, in the shoulder of uh, the book, um, our editor had asked us to have a very quick uh, reference guide for natural products in pregnancy, so something very simple. So what we designed was red means no and green means go. Um, so in the herbals that we looked at, um, you may lose a little bit of the color between the green and the yellow from the back there, but um, in the reds, uh, something uh, like barberry and Oregon grape, which I'll talk about uh, in a few slides. Uh, parsley and pennyroyal are traditionally used as abortifacients, so this would kind of defeat the purpose of uh, maintaining a pregnancy. Uh, foxglove is a weed that you find by the side of highways, but it's also from which what we've, we've synthesized uh, the joxin. So uh, there's some issues with that. Uh, juniper could be teratogenic, and obviously something called deadly nightshade can't be good in pregnancy. Um, so this one we weren't very, we weren't surprised to, uh, to find that. Uh, echinacea, we'll talk a bit of it down the road. Uh, horse chestnut has been studied for uh, varicose veins uh, in clinical trials and chronic venous insufficiency. Uh, sun has been studied for constipation. St. John's wort we'll talk about. Valerian's been studied with um, insomnia. Uh, garlic's been studied with preeclampsia, unsuccessfully, unfortunately. Um, and ginger we'll talk about down the road. 
Uh, we also looked at a number of um, uh, supplements, so that's kind of the umbrella category for things like glucosamine sulfate, coenzyme Q10, et cetera. Um, and we looked at vitamins. Um, at the time, while it still remains, vitamin A is a, is a dose-dependent relationship. You're not meant to exceed 6,000 international units of vitamin A on a daily basis. Um, at the time we worked on these uh, reviews, uh, there were no issues with respect to vitamin E. Uh, however, there's been some recent work showing that uh, when given in the first trimester, uh, actually vitamin E may increase the risk of uh, uh, cardiovascular defects uh, in newborns. So specific to that first trimester, it seems like given in the second and third trimester, they haven't seen any uh, adverse events with that. So there's, there, there's some issues there. Um, so uh, with respect to natural products and respect to pretty much anything in pregnancy, obviously the risk of birth defects uh, depends on the timing of the intervention. So this is a slide that, that I'm sure uh, many of you have seen in this room. These are the weeks of gestation at the top. Uh, red is the risk of major malformation. Yellow is the risk of minor malformation. Um, what happens in, um, uh, in, in, in the case of a pregnancy is in many cases about half the pregnancies are unplanned. And if someone would be coming to my office, they could be taking herbal medicines that women of childbearing age may take as a general rule to help with regulating periods, to help with period cramps. So they could be taking evening primrose oil, cramp bark, vitex, black cohosh, uh, et cetera. So what could typically happen in an unplanned pregnancy is, okay, so by about four weeks, um, there's no period. Five weeks, you start to worry. Six weeks, while well, you do a home pregnancy test, takes a week to see your doctor, by eight weeks you're confirmed pregnant. So by this point, eight, eight or nine weeks, you've probably hit most of your major risks of malformations. So um, the point of natural health products is also uh, identifying these products that could be of use or could be of danger to, to women um, of childbearing age, particularly when we know that they're trying to conceive and not. Um, so I'm going to go through by category here. Um, ginger. Um, commonly used to uh, treat uh, nausea. Uh, it's been used to treat uh, nausea post-chemotherapy. Uh, it's been used to treat uh, motion sickness. Um, in pregnancy, it's been, uh, there's about seven clinical studies on ginger to treat nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. So I'll just go through a couple of them. Um, in this study, it was a randomized clinical trial. Uh, they gave 1,500 milligrams of ginger over four days, and they found an improvement in nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. And also what they did is that they followed birth outcomes, um, and what they found is that there were no uh, difference in birth outcomes versus controls. So um, uh, gestational age was similar, birth weight was similar, uh, APGAR scores were similar, uh, risk of major minor malformations were similar in both groups. Um, and in other studies, there's just been variations on the dose. Um, and in this other study, the first one at the top here, uh, they gave 1,000 milligrams, and the study below, they gave it along with vitamin B6, um, and uh, in the study here, they actually gave it as uh, ginger syrup. Um, I typically, when I recommend ginger to pregnant women, I normally recommend they just take it as a tea. Because um, normally at that point, if they're suffering from nausea and vomiting, it's difficult to, to have them take the pills or the capsules orally. So as a tea, I find it seems to work well. Uh, vitamin uh, B6, so recommended by the American College of um, Obstetrics and Gynecology as a first-line treatment for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. Um, there's been uh, um, two main clinical trials. Um, so the first one was where they gave it uh, 25 milligrams every eight hours, and they found it was effective at reducing nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. And the second one, they gave 10 milligrams every eight hours. Uh, they found it improved nausea, but they found there was no uh, effect on uh, vomiting. Okay, um, so this is where it gets uh, interesting. Um, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the midwifery world and in the traditional herbal world, uh, there's a, a list of herbal medicines that you give to uh, prepare labor, to, to prepare the uterus. It's typically called the partus preparatus. So these will include things such as red raspberry, blue cohosh, black cohosh. So these could be administered by naturopaths or nurse midwives or herbalists, et cetera. So there's some variability between what gets put into this mixture or some people do single ingredients. So I'll, I'll take you through some of the main ones that have been studied in the literature. Um, so red raspberry, commonly given as a tea. Um, this could be used uh, or it's been traditionally been used for fertility. Um, some women only take it 
probably about uh, in the last two months of delivery, whereas some women take it throughout pregnancy. There's some, there's some traditional uh, uh, differences of a therapeutic uh, opinion there. Um, but in this case, we have a clinical trial on it, which is, which is nice in pregnancy. Um, so in this case, they were given 1.2 grams of red raspberry leaf as a capsule, uh, although typically it's given as a tea. In this case, it was given as a capsule. Um, so they found no adverse effects to the mother or the infant. Uh, what they did find is that it did shorten the second stage of labor, and it did lower the rate of uh, forceps delivery. Uh, in another study, this was a retrospective cohort, uh, what they found is that uh, when women took uh, red, uh, red raspberry leaf versus controls, uh, they were less likely to uh, receive an artificial rupture of their membranes, uh, they were less likely to require a C-section, they were less likely to uh, require forceps or vacuum birth. So the question is, would be, well, what's the mechanism of action? Um, thus far, it's unclear. Uh, what we know from human data is that uh, it seems to have a stimulatory and spasmolytic effect on the uterus. Um, so it might be dose-dependent and tissue-dependent. So uh, one of the theories is that in low doses, it might cause more contractions, whereas in high doses, it may actually be spasmolytic. So at this point, we don't quite understand the the, the nature of the uh, mechanism of action of red raspberry. Um, from animal data, it has been tested directly onto rat uterus, and it doesn't show it have a direct uh, uterine um, uh, contraction effect. Uh, castor oil, which um, I'm sure some people are familiar with uh, in the room, it's commonly used as a very aggressive uh, laxative. Uh, it's usually used um, by nurse, midwives, or pregnant women to initiate labor. Uh, so in this uh, uh, prospective cohort, uh, what they did is they looked at about 100 women that were uh, basically post-term, um, and the primary outcome was the initiation of labor within 24 hours. So uh, one group received uh, 60 milliliters of castor oil, which is about four tablespoons, and the other group acted as control. So in the group that received castor oil, um, about uh, 30 out of the 52 women, so about just about 57, 60% of the women initiated labor within 24 hours. And the women that initiated labor within 24 hours actually went through with a full vaginal delivery. So there's no need to, to for 83% of them, there's no need to have a C-section. Um, and basically, with respect to birth outcomes, there are no adverse effects uh, in the group receiving castor oil uh, versus controls. So uh, mechanism of action, um, well, one thing which is extremely important, the oil doesn't contain the deadly uh, poison uh, ricin, uh, which would obviously be counterproductive. Um, basically what happens when it's ingested, it's uh, metabolized in the duodenum uh, by pancreatic lipase into uh, ricinolinic acid. Uh, we're not sure if ricinoleic acid has a direct irritant effect on the, um, uh, on the smooth muscle of the small intestines and the large intestines. We're not sure. We think it may be a bit more of an osmotic effect, um, but usually it triggers bowel evacuation in about two to six hours. Now, in uh, pregnancy, the mechanism of action um, is believed that the, um, the, the laxative effect induces a hyperemia to the bowels, which then causes a reflex stimulation to the uterus. Um, and also, it may increase uh, prostaglandin production, so PGF2 alpha, so which may stimulate, may stimulate uterine activity. Um, the next um, natural product, which is commonly used um, to, uh, to initiate labor is probably of most concern, and that's uh, blue cohosh. Um, so there's been uh, three uh, reports in the literature of cardiovascular-related um, uh, side effects with women who've taken blue cohosh during pregnancy. So in all these cases, there, it's normally been unsupervised use of blue cohosh, so it's basically someone who's either heard from a friend or been told just to go take this, and they've, and they've taken it, uh, it would appear uh, beyond the therapeutic levels. So in one case, we had an acute myocardial infarction, and in another case, we had severe multi-organ hypoxic injury, and in the third case, we had a perinatal stroke. Uh, and in the, the fourth case report, because we know from animal data that blue cohosh um, has a direct uh, uterine stimulant effect. It will cause uterine contractions. It's not surprising to see that it would also have an abortifacient effect. Um, 
When surveyed, which is interesting, 64% of nurse midwives in the United States do use blue cohosh to initiate labor. Um, however, this is the herb they use with the least amount of confidence. This is the one that worries them the most. Um, so with respect to mechanism of action, um, we know that the glycosides colosapinin and colophilosapinin and the chemical spartine seem to induce uh, labor contractions. Um, what's responsible for the constriction, also blue cohosh is responsible for the constriction of coronary arteries, which is probably why we see the cardiovascular defects that, that, that we encounter. Um, also the alkaloids anagerine and N-methylcytosine may be teratogenic. However, given that this is usually given to initiate birth uh, in the, towards the end of the third trimester, it's likely not going to do much damage at this point. And also the alkaloid taspine may be embryotoxic, but once again, given its timing of the intervention, um, that's not really relevant. It's not a herb that's commonly given to help with fertility. Um, it's normally given to pretty much initiate labor. Um, another one which is commonly given by nurse midwives is uh, evening primrose oil. So this is um, uh, it's a fatty acid. Um, it's given by uh, uh, midwives to um, trigger cervical ripening. Um, so what was interesting in this study here, so this was a, a quasi-experimental uh, retrospective design, um, they actually showed, they did not demonstrate that evening primrose oil um, was actually able to, to, to ripen the cervix. And also what they showed, which was a, which a bit more uh, uh, concerning, was that it actually seemed to delay labor. So it seemed to increase the incidence of prolonged rupture of the membranes, which would make sense because it's a fatty acid, so there could be some blood thinning effects. Um, it also seemed to oxytocin augmentation, arrest of the scent, and it also seemed to require a higher amount of vacuum extraction uh, of the child. Uh, there's also, with respect to adverse effects, there's a case report of a woman uh, who had taken 6.5 grams a day uh, a week before giving birth, and uh, the baby was born with petechiae, so minor bruising at the time of delivery. Um, one of my favorite areas of, uh, of research is uh, probiotics. I know that the, the title of the uh, topic is, um, is herbal medicines, um, but I thought I'd just take a moment to talk about probiotics here. In um, 2008, we did a meta-analysis um, of uh, clinical trials of probiotics during pregnancy, and what we found, there were a number of uh, strains uh, when given, uh, usually during the uh, last few weeks of uh, gestation, to the mom, um, then to the mom during breastfeeding and or to the child, uh, there was some improvement in the prevention of atopic disease, so usually in the form of eczema, uh, at two years of age and up to four years of age. So most of these studies have been conducted in, uh, in Finland, and some recent ones have been coming out of the United States. So um, in the first one here, this is a study by Calio Mackey. Um, they used Lactobacillus GG. Uh, in the next study, very similar results. Um, and this time they used a combination of Lactobacillus GG, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, and two other, two other probiotic strains. Um, one issue that has been brought up with respect to giving probiotics during pregnancy is because they have uh, an effect on the immune system, it's been suggested that they could perhaps interfere with, excuse me, they could perhaps interfere with vaccination. Um, so in this study, what they looked at was to see if giving uh, probiotics to the mom and to the infant would interfere with uh, uh, with uh, Haemophilus influenza type B vaccination, uh, DPT, um, and in fact, they found that it had no effect on vaccination. Um, these are additional studies. Um, so just to wrap up, when we, on the probiotic side, when we looked at the probiotic in total, we had 11 RCTs, uh, 1,500 patients, and we found no evidence that, um, that the use of probiotics in pregnancy would affect the incidence of C-sections, uh, we found no evidence that it would delay labor, uh, so therefore increasing the risk of preterm delivery, and we found that it had no effect on, uh, on birth weight. Uh, upper respiratory tract infection. Um, one of the common things that's given to um, treat uh, upper respiratory tract infections um, is, some, is echinacea. So uh, this study was uh, published in early 2000, uh, by, by someone from, uh, from Mother Risk, Adrian Einerson. Um, and uh, basically what they did is they looked at uh, 206 women versus 200 who had taken echinacea uh, during pregnancy versus 206 controls. Uh, and what we found, very similar results 
uh, in both numbers. Um, usually people jump at the fact that you see 13 more spontaneous abortions on the echinacea group versus seven spontaneous abortions on the control group, uh, but there are no difference in the numbers. The stats didn't show that there's a significant difference between the groups. Uh, so they concluded that there's no statistical difference between the group, therefore echinacea uh, did not pose an increased risk of uh, malformations during pregnancy. Um, on the other hand, what's commonly given um, as an immune stimulant to treat upper respiratory tract infections are herbs that uh, contain berberine. So herbs such as golden seal, uh, barberry, and Oregon grape. Uh, there's some concern that when given around the time of birth, uh, berberine can displace albumin, uh, can, sorry, can, can displace uh, bilirubin bound to ar albumin and therefore worsen newborn jaundice. So this could be a timing of the intervention, uh, possibly not given around the time of labor, um, uh, but we don't know. It hasn't really been studied beyond that. We just know from animal data that this could be of concern. So uh, for obvious reasons, we recommend that it not be given during pregnancy period. So the herbs that contain that, once again, are barberry, oregon, grape, and golden seal. Uh, and uh, lastly, um, uh, St. John's wort. Um, until about a year ago, uh, the entire evidence of safety in pregnancy of St. John's wort rested on one case report, uh, which was this one here, which is a 38-year-old woman who had uh, taken St. John's wort since her 24 weeks of gestation. Uh, pretty much a normal delivery, normal birth weight, normal APGAR scores, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and through uh, uh, Mother Risk, this was published in uh, 2009, I believe. This is through Milo Moretti. Uh, we actually uh, accumulated a sufficient amount of cases to see uh, if, in fact, there is an increased risk of malformations. Um, so what they did in this study is that they had 54 women had taken St. John's wort during pregnancy. Uh, they had 54 women who are on antidepressants, and then they had 54 uh, healthy women which acted as controls. And uh, with respect to rates of major malformations, uh, across the three groups were 5%, 4%, and 0%. So given that the incidence of major malformations is somewhere between 3 and 5%, they found that there is no statistically significant increased risk of major malformations with taking St. John's work. Um, so uh, on that note, I'm going to uh, uh, conclude. Um, so basically, just to summarize, that there is some uh, evidence um, of safety for selected uh, natural health products, uh, usually related to things like ginger, vitamin B6, uh, probiotics. Um, there's some evidence of harm, uh, which I spoke about at the beginning, issues with respect to blue cohosh, um, deadly nightshade, more serious natural health products. Um, unfortunately, for about 60% of the natural health products on the market, we don't know. Um, and some women are taking these during pregnancy. Um, so we, we obviously recommend that clinicians and pharmacists uh, screen their patients for their natural health product use. Uh, there's clearly a lot more research that needs to be uh, done in that area with respect to blue cohosh, castor oil. Um, I, know, I know there's a midwifery practice in Ontario that's currently looking at group B strep and uh, to see if probiotics could have an effect on this. Uh, we're also looking into studying um, castor oil, seeing uh, the, the birth outcomes with respect to castor oils in Canada. Um, also on the regulatory side, um, something like blue cohosh um, probably shouldn't be available on the shelves. Um, it should be something that should be on Schedule F. It should be by prescription. Um, as it seems like the case reports I, I spoke about earlier are related to a dose-dependent relationship. So uh, we've, we've met with Health Canada last year through Pragmatic, and we hope to do more work with them in the future. And uh, lastly, for resources, um, if, uh, if you're curious about natural health product research, uh, two of the main ones I use, um, which I believe are, um, are free through most hospitals and uh, the universities, the U of T, are uh, naturaldatabase.com and uh, naturalstandard.com. So they're very good uh, evidence-based reviews of a lot of the natural product information out there. So once again, I thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. It's 5 o'clock, I understand. I have a question with respect to the St. John's word. Uh, I always have, um, not only with pregnant patients, but using psychotropics, there can be so many interactions uh, with, uh, with uh, natural um, products. Mm -hmm. um, 
that we are not even aware of, that I'm always weary when, when a patient comes to my office, not only pregnant patient, but otherwise in prescribing medications. Mm -hmm. um, some women will try um, St. John's Ward. My understanding is with respect to St. John's Ward that the mechanism of action is similar to the monoamine oxidase inhibition. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that's good for first trimester. Was, is there any recommendation with respect to? To, to first, uh, um, the, the main issue I'd be more concerned with with St. John's Ward, its effect on cytochrome uh, 3A, the 3A group. Um, that's the main issue with, with St. John's Ward, as it seems to induce a lot of drugs. Um, so there's been reports of um, uh, it interfering with cyclosporin, antiretroviral medication. So in your practice, if it's given along with an antipsychotic, I would, I would recommend it's, it's, it's a discontinuation. St. John's Ward is probably the most tagged natural product in the literature as causing a drug interaction. Right. Yeah. And, and the risk, especially with antidepressants, with any antidepressant mm -hmm. or any agent that, that works through serotonin or, or norepinephrine of risk of serotonin syndrome. So. Uh, because of lack of regulation between the different um, producers, we don't know what the concentrations are. Oh, I see. All right. So your question, right, right. So yeah, yeah. So the the issue would also be the dosing. Um, there, um, the, the the with respect to the the quality of the St. John's Ward, the issue is that we're we're still not sure what the active ingredient is in St. John's Ward. At first, they thought it was hyperfluorin, and now they think it's hypericin. So it used to be standardized to hyperfluorin, now it's standardized to hypericin. Um, with Health Canada regulating natural health products, um, there is um, much better quality control uh, with respect to at least the Canadian product uh, versus something that we'd get in the United States, whereas in the United States, they're regulated as food. So it's a very, very different system right there. So you'd assume that something on the Canadian shelves would have a bit, a bit, bit tighter. But typically, the standard dose for St. John's Ward is 300 milligrams three times a day. That's usually what we see in most studies. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very kindly, Dr. Dugua.